Okay, so here I am with my first thoughts about the NCFCA team policy topic for 2015-16, reform the federal court system. And let me first of all make my administration and the admissions office happy by giving you just a couple of seconds plug for Northwest Christian University. We offer scholarships for forensics, $2,000 renewable annually, and one of the details written into the scholarships is that we give preference to people who competed in the homeschool leagues. So if in a year where we get a lot of applicants and some of them did the NFL and TOC circuit, but others are from NCFCA and STOA, we would honestly rather have the NCFCA and STOA alums because we think that you're a better fit with our community. Okay, that's enough of that. Let's talk a little bit about reform of the federal court system. Now, I have been told over the years that depending on which part of the country you're in, although to some measure across the country, there's a reluctance to use topicality as a strategic or offensive weapon. But there's one phrase in the topic that I think you want to get kind of good, especially early in the season, at debating. And then there's a second issue about the wording of the topic where I'm going to come right out and say that I hope that the league will at least think about tweaking the wording because all they've left is the opportunity for people to go out and write squirrel affirmatives without anything really being added to the topic. So the first thing, the topicality argument is, I think you want to get smart about debating what it means to reform a system. Because you're not reforming just federal courts, you're reforming the federal court system. So if affirmatives at the beginning of the year want to do things as small as even overrule just a single Supreme Court decision or something like that, you want to be able to say that a system is actually a lot of parts put together in the dynamic relationships between them, and a change in one place does not change the system. And I think that if you go and look up definitions of system, and if you watch carefully while you're doing sort of your fundamental reading at the beginning of the year, learning about the federal courts, you will find people discussing what it means to reform something system-wide, that piecemeal patchwork reforms will not work. What will be required is systemic reform, and systemic reform looks like this. And you should cut that evidence and prepare to use it if necessary if you have topicality debates about reforming a system. I also think that you may find it very useful to have some analogies thought out that help explain that. That maybe you say that if you have surgery on your intestines or your stomach, that might be reforming your digestive system. But if tomorrow you have different food than you had today, that's not a reform of your digestive system. What moves through the system, a change in that, is not a change in the system itself. I think you might also say that there might be some use for a, an analogy to the difference between hardware and software, that the federal court system is the hardware, and other things like the particular cases, or even maybe the procedures, that those are the software. And if you get good at that, then you can keep the topic down to pretty manageable dimensions, and you could talk about how the court operates, how the courts operate, and what their power relationships are, and that, I think, is a more manageable set of affirmatives to be prepared to debate. Now, the other issue I wanted to bring up about the wording of the topic Federal court system. I think most people know what federal court means. The Constitution says that the Constitution says there should be a Supreme Court and then other inferior courts as are from time to time established and that Congress decides what their jurisdiction is and judges appointed to the bench serve for lifetime upon their good behavior. But that's those are all, that's all in Article 3 of the Constitution, and when you start reading law review articles or legal texts on this, you're going to see them referred to as Article 3 courts, because there are federal courts established in other parts of the Constitution, and reforming them, as the topic is currently worded, is topical. So courts established by the United States in territories, courts in Guam, courts in Samoa, those are federal courts. Courts martial in the military, those are federal courts. Tax courts, Bankruptcy courts, immigration courts, social security courts, those aren't Article III courts. They're not the kind of courts you probably think of when you think about the federal court system. And as a matter of fact, just a quick aside, years and years ago when I was coaching debaters who were competing in CETA, back then it was still a common argument by the negatives that the affirmative was responsible not for having a plan that was a subset, but that they were responsible for the whole resolution. They had to defend the resolution as a general statement. 
And one argument you would hear every once in a while was the resolution flaw, the res flaw, that there was something about the resolution that made it an incoherent statement, no matter what the affirmative's case happened to be. One year, the topic was resolved. The United States military intervention to protect democracy is justified in a post-Cold War world. Uh, I think it was 1994, spring 94. And there was a team that one of their main negative strategies was res flaw. We're not living in a post-Cold War world, so the resolution is incoherent. Why do I bring this up? Because the ornery part of me says you could put together a res flaw argument that says the different kinds of federal courts are so distinct and diverse, they're so separate from one another, that there is no such thing as the federal court system. And the thing that you could do to fix this, if you were to tweak the wording of the topic, is if it just said Article Three federal courts, that's a term of art that's used in legal literature all the time, and it would limit it to the district courts, circuit courts, appellate courts, and United States Supreme Court. And that would be endlessly debatable, but wouldn't, it wouldn't have all these little outliers here that you had to be ready for just in case. Okay, once you get down to deciding what's a good approach on the affirmative, I'm getting ahead of myself. I want to give the plug that I give every year. The plug I give every year is your first wave of work on the topic should be to browse, to do a sweep, to go and look at books that are about the federal court system in general, to go to law reviews, which these days the, the, the most sensible way to do that is electronically through Lexis, or you know if you've got a good law library handy, that's a good way to do it too. But what you want to do is you want to find out what's out there. You want to do very broad spectrum searching. You do not want to try to sit in a room far away from your library and decide what the topic is going to be about. Now, what I have done is I have gone and done kind of a quick and dirty sweep. And so there are some things that are sticking out to me that I think have promise. And these could be sort of the beginning of your brainstorm list. But if you limit yourself to what you already know about, if you limit yourself to things that sound familiar to you, then you're going to go to your first couple of tournaments, and other people who research more broadly are going to just beat you like a drum because they're going to stumble across issues and proposals that you never even thought about. So go out and educate yourself before you start committing to any of this. With all that said, the first thing I think you'll find, and the thing I think is going to be the heart of this topic, is what I would call the personnel problem. The personnel problem. And the personnel problem has got several facets. It's got the facet that there are too few federal judges, that a lot of the federal judges, well, at least some of the federal judges are too old and do not know when to quit, and that they are not paid adequately. So too few, too old, underpaid. Too few. You cannot throw a rock in the law review literature without hitting 50 articles bemoaning the shortage of federal judges and the backlog in the federal court system because the politics of confirming a federal judge have become completely dysfunctional. And it does not matter what the party is of the occupant of the Oval Office because the minority party in the Senate can do all sorts of things to hold up confirmation. And there are several different proposals out there, pretty sensible ones, for how to deal with this. Uh, Elizabeth Anderson has an article in the New England Law Review in the spring of 2013, and her argument is, copy England. England came up against this a couple of years, and what they did is they went to a system of using a commission or a committee that screens judicial applicants. And there's a similar proposal from Michael Teeter, and this is in the Ohio State Law Journal in 2012, and he says the way we did military base closures after the fall of the Soviet Union, we had a commission that was shielded from politics. We should do something similar to vet judicial appointees or judicial nominees. And those proposals, you might find that when you get in and read them, that there are important differences between them, but at their heart, they're really doing something kind of similar. They're saying, let's do this, let's hand this off to a technocrat, and let's see if we can't insulate out this storm of politics that gets going just so we can get some of these judgeships filled, and just so the people who are choosing the judges, so they don't feel the, the political pressure to pick people who are polarized, but instead they have the political cover to let someone else choose an expert who's going to be really, really good at the job. There are a couple of other ideas that I thought were fairly good. Michael Schenkman has a proposal in the Arkansas Law Review in 2012, and what he says is change, and he says you can do this without a constitutional amendment, change how district court judges are appointed. 
make your reforms to where the politics is taken out of appointing the district court judges because that would make such a huge difference and because the politics surrounding filling those benches is really kind of irrational because the district courts mostly are triers of fact. They're the ones who will hear the trial, not the appeal. And it's the appeal that has the value of setting precedent. So filling the appellate benches, that's something that is politically sensitive because if you have a judge who has an ideological bent politically, that judge can hand down a lot of very controversial rulings that kind of reshape the whole face of the country. But a district court judge doesn't do that. A district court judge serves as the referee or sometimes the trier of fact in a bench trial for, is this person guilty or not? And that has little or no precedential value. So his idea is you come up with a very streamlined method for confirming people who are nominated for the district court slots and you can address a whole lot of the problem, take the edge off the problem and not really unleash any of the political problems and not have to amend the Constitution because the Constitution does not say what the confirmation process has to be like. It just says when they're appointed that they get to continue to serve upon good behavior. Then finally, there's a book by Richard Posner, and Richard Posner is kind of a legend in the legal field. He has a 2009 book, The Federal Courts Challenge and Reform, and that's something I think you ought to read in the summer while you have some time, because he goes into the nooks and crannies of the problem, and he has a, a whole string of proposals that he considers both the strengths and the weaknesses of. So that would be time well spent if you wanted to get at kind of the heart of the topic. Okay, a second area of the personnel problem is this is one that crops up every few years, and it seems like we've just had bad timing because proposals have come, up, have come up for what to do about this. If you are confirmed to a federal judgeship, then you get to stay in your federal judgeship until you decide it's time to retire. And a whole lot of judges decide in a timely fashion, or they die of old age before they become completely decrepit. But unfortunately, there are some who don't know when it's time to leave. There's a book by Bob Woodward back in the 1970s called The Brethren, and it's an inside look at the Supreme Court. It's really kind of an interesting read, and it tells the story of the last days of Justice William Douglas on the Supreme Court and how he really got to the point where he couldn't do the job anymore, where he had had a stroke and his mind was wandering, and he absolutely refused to step down. And the law says there's really not much you can do in that circumstance. They had the other justices and good friends of his go and beg him to retire, and he ultimately did announce his retirement, fill out a memo to that effect and sign it, and then change his mind. And it happened several times. And if you go digging in the literature, you're going to find that there are a number of different proposals. The simplest proposal that I've seen is just have a mandatory retirement age of 75. At 75, you're done. There was one by Michael Mazza in the Gonzaga Law Review in 2003, and what he said was, instead of having a hard retirement age, what you do instead is, after a certain number of years or at a certain age, you rotate off the appellate bench and you go back and you become a district court judge. And he's sort of operating off a similar premise to Michael Shankman in that he's saying the need is the greatest in the district court slots, and that's also where they have a lot less influence. And it's also, I would think, probably the workload would more motivate people to retire because if they had to go back to that workload, it would become more plain to them that they weren't, really weren't capable of the work anymore. And then there's one other proposal that you'll run across. I didn't put the citation down here, but it was, it's, it's got golden parachute in the title of the article. And what it says is, what you, and it's, I believe it's really only talking about this strategy for Supreme Court justices, but it says at the age you want them to retire, arbitrarily, let's say 75, what you do is you offer them a pension that is twice what they're currently making. So effectively bribe them to retire. I don't know that that would be too promising as an affirmative. I think that negatives would have kind of a field day, uh, at just churning up negative arguments for that, and rhetorically it puts you in kind of a bad position. But it's a proposal that's been made pretty seriously. The final one is the idea that federal judges are woefully underpaid, and there are lots of repercussions to this, that federal judges who are underpaid are under-motivated, you can't recruit the best talent, federal judges who are underpaid are more open to being bribed, and Chief Justice of the United States John Roberts a couple of years ago gave a speech in which he called the pay for federal judges a constitutional crisis. So I think one of the things that you'll hear during the year is different proposals for how to tweak the pay for federal judges to get at that problem. 
Okay. Apart from what I would call the personnel problem, there are a few other areas you might want to look into. There are some proposals for what to do about judicial ethics and judicial conduct. And there's a citation that we put up on our Facebook page and out on our Twitter feed a couple of days ago by Dana Remus at the Yale Law Review in 2012. And this article talks about how the federal appellate system, the, the federal court system, is really, it's kind of worked its way into a situation where it's supposed to be self-regulating. And that, the purpose of that is to maintain judicial autonomy, keep judges insulated from political pressure. But in some ways, it's made things very dysfunctional. And Remus talks in that article about how judicial conduct regulation should not be only about catching misconduct, but really it should be about modeling, modeling ideal conduct. It should be about shaping the conduct, especially of people who are brand new to the bench, and helping them to grow through those first few years until they're really good in their roles. And Remus has got a number of proposals at the end of that article for what to do about judicial conduct. And that, I think, would be right at the heart of the topic. I think that that's the kind of thing where you can, if you go dig around, you can find some really good examples to illustrate what the harm is of judicial misconduct. You can make it really easy and understandable and then talk about how, you know, who watches the watchers. When people get to rule on their own conduct, that's the kind of arrangement that just corrupts almost inevitably. I think that could be the kind of affirmative, whereas at the beginning of the year it might seem kind of drab, like it doesn't have a lot of pizzazz. You get comfortable explaining it and you could really, really sell it to judges. So that's the kind of thing, if I were coaching debaters debating this topic, that one would really catch my eye. I think you ought to give that a look. I also think that you want to look into, especially if you have friends who did STOA last year, I think you want to look into FISA courts, look into foreign intelligence surveillance courts, the ones who pass on the government's requests, they, they decide on the government's requests for warrants to tap into communication with people overseas. And we keep finding out that these FISA warrants actually cover all kinds of communication that we didn't think they did before. But there's a lot written about it. There are a lot of proposals for how to rebalance that power and how to change it. So I think at the beginning of the year, if you don't have FISA courts on your list of things to read up on, I think that needs to be pretty high on the list. Because among other things, just because a year or two ago when the Snowden revelations first came out, so much was written. The nice thing is some of that has died down. It kind of frothed up and now it's kind of settled. And so a lot of the more dire warnings and the more dire alarms that were sounded back then, they're a little bit dated and people are kind of walking back their claims a bit. But there is a big enough volume and there is a big enough set of proposals for how to check it that it is going to take a fairly big segment, I think, of your work time if you want to be fully prepared if someone comes along with a big FISA affirmative. Or it might be that you discover a proposal that's really strategic and really defensible, you wind up running a FISA proposal, or FISA affirmative. I think that is going to be a fairly big segment of the topic. Beyond that, I would separate it into there are about three more broad areas that you want to learn a good deal about. You want to learn about pretrial detention and services. If someone is arrested and indicted, and you're, and this, this gets a little bit into federal law enforcement, so I think there might be a topicality argument about whether this is under the supervision of the court. But the courts have to make a lot of decisions about pretrial detention, about pretrial services, and so forth. And it, the, the, about the, gosh, Mid-1990s, one of the years that I coached, the, I, I coached the CETA MNDT debate at the University of Georgia. Our topic that year was that the United States should adopt substantial changes to, to procedures in federal courts in pretrial detention and or sentencing. And at the beginning of the year, I remember a lot of us thought that sentencing was going to be the big area of the topic. But the teams that came out and they had done the reading and the work to put together pretrial detention affirmatives, they were really good. The evidence was really high quality, and it was really hard to find negative arguments against them. Now, I do not know if 20 years later that's still the case, especially in the wake of September 11th and with some of the practices that have been adopted in the wake of that for holding people who have been suspected of a crime. But that's something that you want to go out and do your reading on. It's something that doesn't necessarily get as much press coverage as some of these other areas, and that's what caught us off guard at the time. So pretrial detention and pretrial services, that's something that, that's, that could be, depending on 
what's going on right now, that could be a very promising ground for affirmatives. Then as far as sentencing reforms, I do know that over the past several years, there have been a lot of steps back from mandatory minimums and a lot of the federal sentencing guidelines, some of the imperfections in that system. But you still want to go and look and see what is the state of federal sentencing and are there proposals out there for making them more, making them smarter, making them less excessive, making them less irrational, because that's a whole domain of the topic that you're going to want to be on top of. Then I have, and this is how big this topic is, especially if you go beyond Article Three courts to all the different kinds of federal courts, just as a lump, I've put down civil cases, because I've been talking as though the, the whole topic is, is criminal, and it's clearly not. There are all kinds of lawsuits that pass through federal courts, and so there are civil rights lawsuits, and over the past year, with the various shootings in different places around the country, where it seems as though police have used excessive force, some people argue, in dealing with unarmed suspects, a lot of those have turned into civil rights lawsuits. And so there's some controversy over how those are handled, and there are some proposals for how to handle civil rights lawsuits more rationally. And you should go dig around in that literature, be ready for it, and be watching for possibly good affirmatives. There's also a lot of disability law, the Americans with Disabilities Act. Whenever an ADA suit is brought, that's a federal suit, goes to federal court. And sometimes the evidence requirements, sometimes the burden of proof, if, if you go digging for what people had to say about how to tighten those, how to make those more rational, you might find a good affirmative in there. Speaking of disability law, just all of employment discrimination law. There are state employment discrimination laws, but a lot of it is handled by the EEOC, the Equal Opportunity Employment Commission. And when EEOC gives people permission to go ahead and sue because EEOC finds that you have a reasonable case of employment discrimination, that's the kind of thing that can go to federal court. And then what I talked before about the personnel problem, this could be the civil courts and the fact that lawsuits aren't being heard. That could be an offshoot or that could be a harm area for that particular problem because there is a ridiculous backlog of suits that are just languishing in federal court. But of course, that could also be the initial link for a negative argument. You might be able to say that the shortage of, ju shortage of judges and the backlog of cases actually stops a lot of irrational suits from going forward, and a lot of those irrational suits might be the kinds of things that would hurt business confidence. So one of those sort of bad is good things. Clog is good because it discourages people from frivolous litigation. That has some potential. And it just popped into my head, I didn't put it on my list, but a lot of environmental lawsuits, a lot of lawsuits brought against corporations or other entities for pollution. You might find, if you go and you dig into the literature surrounding those, that there are evidence requirements, that there are procedural requirements that are making those in some way damaging or inefficient, and you might be able to claim that by improving them you improve protection of the environment, or that you stop frivolous environmental claims that are hurting business confidence, and that might be really kind of appealing for the judge pool that you've got. Okay, one set of cases that would be topical, and you will find people advocating them. I'm going to warn you. My take on it is that they are a really dumb idea, and in the long term you won't win them consistently, and that is jurisdiction stripping. Jurisdiction stripping. What the Constitution makes explicit is that Congress has the prerogative to say for each federal court, your jurisdiction includes this, does not include this. Through the years, whenever people have proposed legislation stripping courts of jurisdiction over an issue, you'll find printed arguments that say this is a good idea. And then when you go and you find the literature answering it and talking about the dangerous precedent that it sets, it's really not a good idea. And so... When I was younger, I remember that there were people who were saying that prayer in schools needed to be stripped away from the jurisdiction of the federal courts. And there have been people who've, been, who've proposed over the years that abortion, that federal courts needed to lose jurisdiction over abortion cases. More recently, some people have said that federal courts should lose jurisdiction over marriage discrimination cases. You go back, just in case you think that the politics all run away, you go back to the early 1900s in the period between the Civil War and the Roosevelt administration, and there were people on the left wing who were saying that federal courts needed to lose jurisdiction over equal protection cases, because back then, in the era of the slaughterhouse cases, 
They kept ruling that the Equal Protection Clause only meant that the United States could not put limits on people's use of their property, which meant business decision makers were free to make any decision they wanted as regarded their business, but that individuals bringing discrimination claims, that that wasn't really what the Equal Protection Clause meant. And people who were horrified by the slaughterhouse cases, they kept arguing in print, just strip them of the jurisdiction. So. Someone during the year, I bet, is going to run an affirmative, take jurisdiction over this entire issue area away from federal courts. And if you do your homework right now, I think you're going to find that the negative arguments that that is a terrible idea are a lot more powerful than the arguments for it. And if you run across someone who's advocating that for any particular issue area, I would warn you, I really don't think you want to go down that road as your own affirmative. Okay. One last time, this is not what we think the entire topic is going to be. We will be back in a few days for a brainstorm session on a Google Hangout that you're welcome to take part in, but this is just to get you started. It's just a breakground to push your thinking in some productive directions so you can do your own brainstorming and you can get started learning about your shiny new topic.